Hello! During this video, I will demonstrate how to correctly set up a root certificate authority. Setting up your own certificate authority, also known as a CA, can be a difficult process. Web browsers and email clients won't recognize your CA out of the box, so most people opt to use public CA infrastructure. However, when security matters, Using a public CA is the wrong solution. Privately owned and controlled CAs can be infinitely more secure than their public counterparts. Unfortunately, most people who set up a private CA don't set up their CA infrastructure correctly. Here is what most private CAs look like. What we see here is a two-layer certificate chain, the root CA certificate, and the server certificate signed by the root CA certificate. This is wrong because the server certificate has to be regenerated regularly, usually on an annual basis. If the root certificate is compromised, then it involves a fairly significant effort to replace all of the certificates that were signed by the root, including the root, and certificate revocation lists, or CRLs, can't be used to revoke a root CA cert. What should be built is this. Here we see a three-layer certificate chain, the root CA certificate, an intermediate certificate signed by the root CA certificate, and finally the server certificate signed by the intermediate certificate. This is in fact the format that most public CAs use. The root CA certificate is generated on a machine that isn't connected to any network. Then it's used to generate any necessary intermediate certificates. Both the root and the intermediates are signed for long periods of time, typically about 10 to 30 years for the root and two to five years for the intermediates. The root CA certificate private key is then physically secured. A physical vault of some sort helps here. The root CA is never ever used on a network connected machine. It is always used offline and it is only ever used to generate intermediate certificates. Only when specific conditions are met is the private key ever accessed. Usually those conditions entail a paper trail of accountability with multiple people who are physically present and are authorized to access the root key for purposes declared in advance. After the root CA generates the intermediate certificates and is secured, the intermediate certificates are then used to generate other certificates, such as the server certificates. The intermediates can possibly sit on a network-connected machine, but that machine is generally behind a very well-guarded firewall. So how does one create this setup while implementing it easily and securely and relatively cheaply? To get started, you'll have to acquire a few items. Some USB thumb drives that are preferably brand new. You will need three of them for personal individual use, or six if you are creating a root CA for a small business or larger entity. You will also need a permanent marker, a pen, a blank CDR and a CD burner, an externally powered USB hub with at least four open ports, a label printer or some sticky labels, and multiple physically secure locations for storing the various thumb drives, possibly including the use of anti-tamper technologies. You are also going to need a few pieces of software, VirtualBox or VMware, KeePass, and finally, an ISO of a public Linux distribution such as Slytaz or TinyCore Linux. The smaller the distribution, the better off you'll be. Now that we've gathered all our pieces together, let's get this root CA built. First, make sure everyone is in the room who needs to sign off on the construction of the root CA. Decide in advance which of the people present will receive thumb drives containing important data required to decrypt the virtual machine and the root CA private key. It will speed things up considerably if the individual doing the technical side, setting up the virtual machine, 
burning the CD, things of that nature, has gone through a dry run in advance to get familiar with this process. Now I'm going to start an audit log on my first USB thumb drive. This will contain various bits of information such as date, the time, and the notes for this date and time. So I'm starting started audit log and of course I am present. If there were other people present, I would list them on the first line as well. And I will repeat this for every operation that I do, including every command I'm going to execute against the virtual machine I'm going to eventually create. If I ever access this in the future, for example, to generate a new intermediate certificate every couple of years, I will also update this file at that time. The next step is to make the Linux distribution ISO in my case, I'm using Tiny Core Linux, read only to all users. A simple solution to making any file read only is to burn that file to a CD or a DVD as an ordinary file. To save time, I'm going to go ahead and download the ISO and prepare the CD as it should be prepared, and then I'll return to the video after I've done that. I have now completed the process of burning the ISO to disk as well as its MD5 signature and also updated my audit log to reflect what I have done. Now I'm ready to verify the ISO against public information such as this MD5 hash. To do this properly, I need to compare the same public verification information from the same source at a secondary location. Here is Tiny Core Core Plus 641's MD5 hash. I'm going to use a remote SSH session to one of the digital ocean droplets that I have, and I'm going to retrieve the same URL, and we can see that they are identical. Finally, we need to verify that the ISO MD5 hash matches the hashes seen so far. I've already run a built in Windows command, and we can see that the signatures match. Thus, we have mitigated the possibility of a man-in-the-middle attack. And I've also updated my audit log with the various steps of the signature comparison process. We are now ready to construct our virtual machine using the ISO image. Before I can set up my virtual machine, I need to create two passwords. And I'm going to use KeyPass for this. To do this, I'm going to open up my second USB thumb drive and plug it in. I'm going to put a portable version of KeyPass onto the same thumb drive as the audit log and the virtual machine. And once again, I add my entry to my audit log. For the purposes of a root CA, there will never be the opportunity to update the software. So I'm going to disable automatic updates. And now I'm in KeyPass. I'm now going to create a new KeyPass database on the second thumb drive that I just inserted. You should probably be labeling the thumb drives at this point so that uh, you don't lose track of which one does what. Passwords. KeyPass next asks how you want your database to be encrypted. If you are an individual, you can use just the master password by itself or master password plus a key file provider. If you're an organization, you only use key file provider and store the key file provider on the third of the six USB thumb drives. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to set up both a master password And I'm going to set up a key file provider. If I were using the six USB thumb drives, I would store the key on the third of the sixth thumb drive. Since I'm just doing this for personal use, I'm going to store it on the same thumb drive as the KeyPass software and my audit log. I'm going to click Save. OK. Now I'm going to click OK. 
set up an optional name and custom database color and click OK. KeePass creates some default entries, so clear those out. And now create our first entry, enter your title, and then come down to this little icon that says generate a password. Click open password generator, select 40 as the number of characters, and we'll just go ahead and go with the defaults there. Click OK. Now we have a much longer password that's 40 characters long, and now I've created my VirtualBox encryption password. Now I'm going to repeat the process for the root certificate private key. I'm now ready to save. We now have our passwords generated. And finally, I updated my audit log to reflect the database creation and password generation process that I just went through. Now I'm ready to create the virtual machine. I already have VirtualBox started, so I click New, and I say Tiny Core Root CA Linux, and it's a generic Linux, so we'll go, th and it's also 32-bit, not 64-bit, as it had picked out. I'm going to click Next. 256 megs of RAM works for Tiny Core. You might need more if you use a more beefy OS like Ubuntu. Create a virtual hard disk. Virtual box disk image works. Dynamically allocated. Uh, I want to relocate where it's going to put the virtual hard drive because I want this to be on my thumb drive. Excellent. Click OK. I'm going to drop it to 3 gigs. It is a tiny OS, so there's no way it will ever use that much storage. Create. And now I have my virtual machine created. Before I can start the virtual machine, I want to do a few things. I want to disable some options and, more importantly, enable encryption. So I'm going to select AES XTS256 Plain64. I'm going to grab my first password out of KeePass. Just double click on the password, it goes on the clipboard. You never, ever, ever want to see what the password is for security reasons. Now I'm going to click OK. And now it's encrypted. I'm going to go back into settings one more time. And I am going to select, it says empty. I'm going to use a live CD DVD mode and I'm going to select host drive I'm going to choose choose the file and I'm going to load the ISO off of the CD I'm going to disable audio don't need that I will eventually disable network but not yet and everything else looks okay so I'm going to click OK now I'm ready to start the virtual machine. And it asks me for the encryption password right off the bat. So I'm going to grab that again. Click OK. Loading everything up. And now Tiny Core Linux is running but it's running off of a live CD, so I need to get it installed onto the virtual machine. I'm going to go ahead and install Tiny Core Linux. Whole disk, SDA, next, X4. I really only, I don't need the GUI, I just need the command line for all of this. So I'm going to go ahead and just do core only text-based interface. I don't need any of the other stuff. Start the installation. Proceed. Now that the installation is completed, I'm going to exit and reboot. Actually, no, I want to shut down first. And I'll show you why in just a second. Uh, 
change my settings, go to storage, and no more live CD for you. Remove disk from virtual drive, click OK. Now I'm ready to boot up for real into Tiny Core. Of course, it asks me for the password again. And I'm going to paste it into the box. Tiny Core is now booted up. The next step is to install OpenSSL, but I gotta first update my audit log. Now the audit log is updated to reflect the most recent changes. The next step is to get OpenSSL installed into Tiny Core. Got a pseudo reboot. Oh, and the other thing I need to do is update my audit log. So I'll do that really quick here. Now my audit log reflects that I've installed OpenSSL on the VM. I'm gonna go ahead and reboot. Okay, it's installed, it looks good. All right, so now we are ready to power off the virtual machine once again. Now things get a little more interesting. We're gonna do one change to the settings of our virtual machine. I'm gonna disable the network adapter. And now this virtual machine lives in total isolation from the rest of the universe. Uh, except for one tiny little thing. I also want to disable my host network interface here. So the easiest way to do that is to go unplug my ethernet cable. My network cable is physically disconnected from my box. So now my entire machine is totally isolated. Uh, Three o'clock PM. I once again update my audit log to reflect that I am now fully disconnected from any networking. I forgot to do one minor thing to my virtual machine. I also need to completely remove the option for the CD-ROM drive. It's also gone, so no more external CD-ROM drive support. Now we're ready to begin constructing the root CA. Before I start up the virtual machine, I need to connect my last thumb drive to the host. And now my last thumb drive is connected to the host. I'm going to go ahead and start the virtual machine up. It's going to ask for my virtual box encryption password, which I grab from KeyPass one more time. Paste it in. Click OK. Now I need to mount my thumb drive that I just connected. Because I have three identical USB thumb drives, it took me a bit to figure out which one I was supposed to mount. Now I've got uh, to create the directory. All right. And now I should be able to do block ID. And there we go. We've got our thumb drive on SDB1. And now I'm mounting the thumb drive into the OS. Oh, except I have to be root to do that. Now if I go over to mount thumb drive, go back to my home directory, mkdir, make dir root ca, chmod, oh. now I'm going to go update my audit log with everything that I just did. And now my audit log is updated. And it's now time to create the actual certificate. This command will create a 4096-bit RSA key 
that will be valid for approximately 10 years from today. I've messed up a few times trying to get this to work. Uh, I've had key pass crash, I've had all sorts of weird issues happen, but this is the correct command and I'm going to go ahead and run it. It's going to generate an RSA private key and now it's asking me for the P and passphrase go back over to KeyPass and I use control V and it goes to the top most window under KeyPass to paste it and it will ask me to do it again. Now it's going to ask a series of questions email address is blank and now we have our root ZA all generated chmod 400 star.pm now I'm going to take a quick look at it and we're looking specifically for CA to be true which is good so this looks like a valid sign CA certificate. I'm going to go ahead and copy to MNT thumb drive. Let's update the audit log. And now we can see that our CA public certificate is stored on the thumb drive. Now we are ready to generate an intermediate certificate which will be used to sign all of the other certificates. To do that, I need to create a copy of the OpenSSL configuration file and modify it so that the intermediate certificate can sign other certificates. That is, it is its own CA. And this command does that. Now I am going to generate the certificate signing request and private key for the intermediate certificate. This command uses the OpenSSL configuration file to create a certificate signing request and a 4096-bit RSA private key. The number of days specified here is part of the request. The CA can choose to honor it or apply its own number of days. It's just good in this particular instance to be consistent. 1095 days is approximately three years. OpenSSL is now asking for a passphrase. This will be used to protect the private keying material as it travels on the USB thumb drive to its destination. The passphrase can be removed once it's reached its destination. Fill out the remaining information. A lot of this will look very similar to the previous information entered for the root CA certificate. Don't enter anything for the challenge password or optional company name. Now it is time to sign the certificate signing request. X509 rec days 1095. This command will sign the certificate signing request for the intermediate CA with the root CA certificate and private key, as well as utilizing the modified OpenSSL configuration file and setting the serial number of the certificate to 01. OpenSSL is now asking for the passphrase for the root CA private key. 
go back over to key pass and we press control V and this sometimes doesn't work and you just have to retry the command again in this case it worked right away adjust permissions be able to view it there we go and we see that it is issued by the root CA we also want to make sure scroll down and make sure that CA is true so that this certificate and private key can be used to sign other certificates and now we're ready to copy the intermediate certificate and the encrypted private key we're now ready to power off the virtual machine. And I have also updated the audit log with the commands that were executed. Make sure that everything looks good before we totally disconnect all the USB thumb drives and, and wrap up everything. The one thing that's not on the main VM thumb drive, even though the main data, 137 megs of data is over here, uh, are all the settings. So I'm going to go ahead and copy those over. Now I've got the virtual box configuration on the thumb drive as well. So if it's on a new machine, it can be imported and it'll be fairly straightforward and quick to make it all work. Move over to the password database. It looks good. It's tiny. This poor thumb drive holds 16 gigs. And then finally we take a look and we see our three files that we need at, on our last thumb drive and we'll put it on infrastructure that we're going to use for generating other keys. Once it's on that infrastructure we might remove the passphrase from this file. And I made one final audit log that says all the data looks good so now I'm ready to close the audit log and now I'm ready to disconnect thumb drives. The last step of the process is to physically secure the thumb drives. This concludes the Root CA tutorial. The official blog post accompanying this video is linked to in the description below. As always, thanks for liking and subscribing, and thank you for watching.